and welcome to the May 11th, 2023 meeting of the Municipality of Anchorage Zoning Board of Examiners and Appeals. Will the secretary please call the roll? Ellen McKay. Here. Dave Hale. Here. Dale Smythe. Here. Jackie Savina. Here. Skyler Quinn. Here. Andrew Romerdahl. Here. Brian Flynn is excused. You have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda are minutes. We have minutes from Thursday, um, April 13th, 2023. Can I have a positive motion, please? Moved by Mr. Quinn, seconded by Mr. Hale. Um, are there any corrections to the minutes? Seeing and hearing none, are, is there um, Objection to approval of the minutes? Hearing none, the minutes are approved and we'll move on to the special order of business to disclosures. Are there any disclosures this evening? Hi, this is Andrew Romerdahl. I have a disclosure. Mr. Romerdahl? Yeah, I uh, need to disclose that I was not present at the April 13th meeting and therefore will abstain voting on tonight's consent agenda through the chair. Thank you. Any other disclosures? Seeing none, we'll move on to the consent agenda. There are two um, items on the consent agenda, resolutions for approval. Uh, there's resolution 2023-004 and 2023-005. May I have a positive motion, please? Moved by Mr. Hale, seconded by Mr. Quinn. Does anyone wish to prove to pull an item from the consent agenda for a discussion? Hearing none, is there any objection to approval of the consent agenda? Seeing and hearing none, the consent agenda is approved. <clears throat> and we'll move on. No appearance requests, no unfinished business, nothing on the regular agenda, which brings us to public hearings. Jackie, are you going to stay with us or are you going to leave? I'm sorry, I do have to go. Okay. And because Ms. Sabina is not going to be with us, that leaves us with a short board. And the short board <coughs> means there's only five members. And the policy is when there is a short five-member board or commission and a postponement is offered to and agreed to by the petitioner, they will be moved to the rec's next regular agenda this should occur within 30 days, which does not require re-noticing the case, new public hearing notices, advertising, etc. If the petitioner is willing to postpone but unable to attend the next available meeting within 30 days, the petitioner has a one-time only option to choose the next date certain he or she can attend at no extra fee. When an appointment is requested by the petitioner, there is a rescheduling fee and a new public hearing date shall be determined by the planning division. This will put their case on the next available cutoff date queue as if they were submitting their case for the first time. So if I could have the petitioners that are here come forward and state your name. Could you turn on your... Yeah. Jacob Hartley. And do you wish to, wish to postpone or go forward? I'm going to proceed, go forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mark Sylvia, Rody Architects, and I do wish to postpone. So that would be the John Emmy case? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, no, you don't have to. It'll be a minute. Just a minute. Okay, so it is a, it is a variance case. And the procedure by which the uh, public may speak to the board at this meeting is, after the staff presentation is completed on the public hearing item, the chair will ask for the applicant to state their case. 
The applicant, including all of his or her representatives, have 10 minutes for the presentation and may reserve time for rebuttal at the end of the public hearing. Throughout the proceeding, the burden of proof rests upon the applicant who must convince the board by a preponderance of evidence that the variance should be granted. A concurring vote of a majority of the fully constituted membership of the board minus those excused by conflicts of interest shall be required to grant a variance. For a variance to be granted, all eight standards must be substantially met. On the conclusion of the applicant's presentation, the board members and the staff may then direct questions to the applicant through the chair. The chair will then open the hearing to public testimony on the issue. Persons who wish to testify will be will follow the time limits established in the rules of procedure. Representative of groups, community councils, PTAs, etc., have five minutes and individuals have three minutes. When your testimony is complete, you may be asked questions by the board. You may only testify once on any issue unless questioned by the board. Time is kept by the secretary. The display in the front will be green to within one minute <clears throat> of the time allowed and then will turn yellow. At this time, you should begin to sum up your testimony and at the end of the allowed time, the light will turn red and a tone will sound. An individual may have appeal rights related to any action the Zoning Board of Examiners and Appeals takes. The parties have 30 days from the date of mailing or other distribution of the decision to file an appeal to Superior Court. Okay, with that being said, we will continue on with case 2023-0033. And the petitioner is Jacob Hartley, and he has indicated that he is here. So would the staff please describe the notice given in this case? Oh, excuse me. I missed a part again. So the first case is actually 2023-0019. Uh, the petitioner is not here. So what do you got, staff? Uh, th thank you, Madam Chair. I believe you have in front of you a memorandum from the planning uh, board. So we sent that memo to serve as notice that uh, the uh, case of, that we re you just referenced um, is requested to be postponed due to insufficient time of posting notification per AMC 210302H5 with the uh, signage uh, on the property. Uh, the planning department recommends approval of the postponement request. So we need a motion. Could I have a positive motion? Mr. Smythe, seconded by Mr. Quinn. Mr. Smythe, would you speak to your motion? Uh, I intend to support my motion to grant the time allowed to for... for um, uh, posting notification. Mr. Quinn? Well, I will also be supporting the motion. Okay. Um, is there, let's see, we'd have, to, we'd have to vote, right? Because, because, Mr. Romerdahl. Okay. Okay, so it has been moved and seconded that we postpone the case 2023-0019 uh, to June 8th due to the petitioner's insufficient time of posting notification. Um, a yes vote will grant the postponement and a no vote will deny the postponement. So please vote. Mr. Romerdahl? Thank you. Okay, five positive votes and um, the motion is carried and the postponement is granted. Now, we're back on case 2023 -0033. Will the staff please describe the notice given in this case? Yes, I will do that. I did forget that this board asked that before, at the, before I present on the case, so it'll take me just a minute to pull it from my staff report.
Yeah. So a total of 274 public hearing notices were mailed on April 17th, 2023, in accordance with the procedures in Title 21, Chapter 3, Section 20H notice. A notice was also provided to the Abbott Loop Community Council. And did you get any back? Uh, we did not receive any uh, written community comments for this case. Uh, I did receive one phone call from a neighbor and after I described what the variance request was, they said that they supported the granting of the variance. Um, I'll also add that the property owner uh, posted a sign on their property. Thank you. Are there any objections to the sufficiency of notice in this case? Seeing none, will the staff please present the case? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, also add just to my previous comments or previous description of the comments we received, uh, we did not get any objections to the granting of this variance from agencies. Uh, this is a request for a dimensional variance for an existing triplex to encroach two and a half feet into the required five foot north side setback. This structure was built initially in 1971 as a single family residence. The single family residence had legal non-conforming rights, but a 2004 addition converted this structure into a triplex. Uh, the triplex therefore does not have legal non-conforming rights. The current property owner purchased the property in 2014 and discovered the encroachment when trying to sell the property in December of 2022. All eight review standards for dimensional variances must be met to approve of the variance request. Uh, I'll review uh, the department's findings for these eight standards. Standard A is not met. The subject parcel is not affected by slope, streams, or wetlands. The lot shape and size are also similar to other properties in the neighborhood. Standard B is partially met. There are not physical constraints of the lot to create an exceptional hardship or deprive the property owner of rights commonly enjoyed by other property owners in the neighborhood. However, the strict application of code in this circumstance would necessitate either moving the structure or removing the addition, which would be a very difficult task given that there's a deep basement and the addition is two stories tall. Standard C is not met. Uh, the municipal setback requirements were the same at the time of purchase by the current property owner and there is documentation of the nonconformity in municipal records that was filed with the previous owner. Therefore, the hardship is self-imposed. Standard D is substantially met. The granting of this variance will not adversely affect the use of adjacent properties. The variance is for an existing triplex and does not increase its size or change its use. The planning department received no comments that objected to the variance request. Standard E is substantially met. The requested variance will not change the character of the R2M district. Uh, triplex is in allowed use within the R2M district. Standard F is substantially met. The encroachment does not result in adverse impacts to the health, safety, or welfare of the people of the municipality of Anchorage. Standard G is substantially met. Uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act is not applicable to this property. And standard, St A standard H is substantially met. The variance requested is the minimum variance that will make possible a reasonable use of the land. The variance will not increase the size or use of the triplex. So in summary, the department finds that standards D, E, F, G, and H are substantially met. Standard B is partially met and standards A and C are not met. Title 21 requires that all eight standards must be substantially met for the variance to be granted. Therefore, the department recommends denial of the variance. However, if after this public hearing, the board finds that all eight standards are substantially met for the variance to be granted, then we recommend approval be subject to the following three conditions. One, that the site plan is substantially in compliance with the petitioner's application narrative submittals in the as-built dated 10-29-14, except as modified by these conditions of approval. Two, that a notice of zoning action including a copy of the approved resolution in Esbilt shall be filed with the state of Alaska recorder's office. And three, that the two sheds that encroach into the 10-foot utility easement along the rear property line 
are either moved outside of this easement or documentation is provided that the utility providers are in agreement that these sheds may remain within the easement. That completes a summary of my staff report. Thank you. Are there any questions of staff by the board? Mr. Quinn. Thank you, Chair. Through the Chair, um, I don't know if you know the answer to this question, but on finding C, it says there's documentation of the nonconformity in municipal records filed with the previous owner. If someone's buying a piece of property, how, how do they know that? Is it, does it show up on a title report or how, how would they know that? Uh, through the chair, the way I found it was I, I looked in our city view records. I, am, I, I don't think that the encroachment was disclosed because I, I could tell that the property was sold at least once before uh, the current owner bought it. It may have been twice. Uh, the, where I found it, it's not with the state recorder's office. Um, so I, I'm... Although the, the previous property owner was informed and I could find documentation, the letter was sent, I, I'm not 100% certain how the, the new buyer would be able to double check that, I, I guess, other than contacting the municipality. Uh, I suppose the title report could have found it because an as -built would have shown that, uh, would have shown the distance that the structure was from the property line. Um, so I suppose that's a bit of a rambling answer, and I, I'm sorry I don't have a, a more exact one, but that's, that's what I got to, to respond to that question. Any other questions? Mr. Smythe. Yeah, thanks to the chair. Um, you mentioned moving the, the sheds. Uh, my impression for utility easement, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is a question because I, I do not recall. I thought if it didn't have a permanent foundation, it could be in the easement. Is that not true? Um, Commissioner Smythe, through the chair, uh, a two sheds um, up to 200 square feet can be within the setback from the property line. Uh, in this case, they're within the utility easement, so that's, that's a different case than the setback requirement from the property line. So for the utility easement, we defer to the utility provider. So if, um, let's say, Chugach Electric says they're okay with the sheds being there or they the they let the property know if they ever have to go digging back there then yeah. their sheds would have to be removed um, then that could be a way to resolve it uh, if the utility provider says they must be moved then the property owner has to remove them good thank you any other questions of staff by the board mr quinn um Piggybacking on that last question, I guess I, I probably should have looked. Did the utility companies, did they um, object to the, the shed location? Um, Commissioner Quinn, through the chair, I, I don't believe that the property owner has communicated yet with the utility easement. It is a condition of approval, though, for this dimensional variance uh, that they, they must communicate with the utility provider to, to either see if they need to remove them or if they can document approval. Okay, but you, but you could get a letter of non-objection and just coordinate that with them. Yes, yeah, yeah, to be clear, yeah, it would just be a letter from the utility company, say, company saying they don't object, and then the property owner would just bring that to us, and then we, we could mark that condition as being met. Okay. Any other questions of staff? Are there any questions of staff by the applicant? indicates not. So, will the applicant come forward? State and spell your name for the record. Jacob Hartley, J-A-C-O-B-H-A-R-T-L-E-Y. Please present your case. Okay, thank you for your time. I'd like to start with uh, just answering maybe some of your guys' questions about those sheds. I did uh, contact Chugach Electric. Uh, they're the main utility going there. There's some overhead lines. And they said, uh, all I need to do is get an encroachment permit and it should be good to go. Um, but other than that, um, I agree with the planning department's findings on approving standards D through H. 
However, I don't fully agree in the denial of standards A, B, and C, so I was going to briefly touch on those. Um, standard A, there exists an exceptional or extraordinary physical circumstance. Uh, there isn't a body of water or anything, or a river or anything going like that through the property. It's just a 0.23 acre lot. Um, but the utility easement is 10 feet wide. It comes towards the house, and it has overhead lines. Um, I didn't build this property, but maybe that was a driving factor of why they built it where they did, so close to the lot line. Uh, standard B, because of these physical circumstances, the strict application of this code creates exceptional undue hardship. It was kind of all explained in um, what Elizabeth was saying. To be, for me to fix this, to get it away from the lot line, um, I'd have to rip it off the old house that was there, and that would it'd essentially destroy the whole property. It has an eight-foot basement, a two-car garage, and on top of that are two little units making a triplex. And to, tear that down would it would it cost way too much for my for me and it would it would destroy the building and then see the the hardship is not self-imposed uh, when I was buying this, this is my first property I bought in Anchorage as I was 23 years old uh, it's fully financed VA loan house uh, I didn't I didn't do my due diligence and, and look into the permitting but it had been there for 10 years. He, bought, he sold it to me as a uh, fully occupied triplex, with three tenants. Uh, the guy who sold it to me is the one who built it. His name's on all the permits. Um, and none of this was disclosed. And, and I also, I didn't add to the building to cause more encroachment to it. Um, but other than that, in conclusion, I understand that this all falls on me because I'm the one who signed the paper. Um, but I feel like there's a series of checks and balance in the buying process that should have caught something like this. Um, if I don't get this variance, I don't really know what to do because I can't reclassify the building into a duplex or a single family home. It still requires the same setback of a 2.5 foot encroachment into a five foot setback. Um, before I found this out, I operated as a triplex for about nine years, and the person who owned it before that operated as a triplex, and no issues. I haven't had any issues from the neighbors. Um, the person who called in, I'm guessing, is my the immediate neighbor. Um, we've just talked about snow clearing and stuff, but and he doesn't have any issues, so that was a, that was good for me. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have. It, it's great housing. It's in a great location. It, pro it provides two more units for people that need homes in the area. Um, yeah, I'd really appreciate it if it was approved. Okay, you have six minutes and 46 seconds left for rebuttal. Okay. Right, is there any questions of um, Mr. Hartley? Are there any questions of Mr. Hartley by the board members? Mr. Smythe? Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hartley, you mentioned nothing was disclosed. And this doesn't surprise me. This isn't the first time we've seen this, a case like this and uh, come in front of the board. Uh, it looks like sloppy surveying to me. But uh, uh, concerning the conversation about what was disclosed during the sale price, or during the sale, um, and also uh, relative to the bank financing it, um, an as-built survey uh, uh, would have been typically produced, and I think I let other board members weigh in on this were familiar, but they didn't, obviously did not catch that during the review or they wouldn't have granted the financing, and that was not the case, I'm going to assume. Yeah, correct. Uh, that's, that's also my thought process, too, when I found all this out. Um, how was it not caught by the financing? Because I called my mortgage lender, and he's like, I, have, I don't know how this fell through all the cracks. Yeah. But... Uh, yeah, it was not disclosed, and I reached back to my old uh, realtor to try to find out, find all the paperwork that came with it and the stuff that she had. There was nothing saying anything yeah. about any of this. Uh, from my experience, uh, my own personal experience, other cases on this board, it is very easy to purchase a house with no knowledge of open elements uh, within plan, plan review with the municipality um, uh, or on uh, other um, uh, disclosed variances needed uh, through the history of the property. That, it can happen without any notice to the homeowner. You have to actually go research that yourself, uh, is my understanding. Uh, no further questions, thanks. Any, any other questions? Are there any questions of Mr. Hartley by the staff? I have no questions. Thank you, Madam Chair.
does the, uh, let's see, now we're going to open the public hearing, so it'll be just a second. Is there anyone from the public wishing to testify in this case, case 2023-0033? Anybody at all? Okay. Um, come forward and state your name. Thank you. Uh, Jared Bierkestrand, I'm with Keller Williams Realty. I'm actually Jacob's uh, real estate agent. Um, could you, I did not, could you oops, spell sorry. your last name, please? Oh, yeah, that will be essential. So my last name or first name as well? Both. Uh, J-A-R-E-D, last name Bierkestrand, B-J-E-R-K-E-S-T-R-A-N-D. Thank you. Did we run out of time? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we were actually going through the process of selling his property. We actually sold it two or three times, and by, on the third time when we did it, we came into the same situation. The only reason why the setback, or the dupe, the triplex portion, the new addition, was caught was by the appraiser themselves, which was very odd. Uh, because typically, yes, um, it's not disclosed if you have permits open. Typically, you would have a disclosure from the seller signing, checking a box, saying you're aware of permits being opened. And that's the recourse. If, for some reason, this situation happens, we can go back, check a disclosure, see that they've checked the box, yes or no, that there are open permits. There was no disclosure that his previous agent could find to show whether or not the seller hid this from us. The appraiser came out and called us and said, hey, there's no way that this has been approved. It's obviously in the setback. Put it on the appraisal. So we looked into it, found that there were open permits, called the Muni, had them come out, try to make it work, because we had buyers that were willing to buy the property. Actually, the third buyer willing to buy the property. And <clears throat> come to find out, all of this happened. The bank still approved us to close. So the buyer could still purchase the property as long as they were OK knowing that there were open permits on the property. Not, and nothing about the setback or anything like that. The bank was willing to pay as long as the buyers wanted to. We stopped the process because it was new information for us. And in good conscience, we could have sold the property if we wanted to, but we did not knowing that there was a permit issue because we were just passing the buck on to the next buyer who was going to have an issue with it until we could get to the bottom of this, clear it up, and move forward, which is the plan if it gets approved we're going to fix everything, put it back on the market, and to sell it to someone knowing this has been completed. You can buy this building without going through what Jacob has. But yeah, it's a, it's, open permits is always a strange one, and it falls onto the seller to disclose. And whether or not it's disclosed to us, it's whether or not someone looks into it, which most buyers do not. They fall on title and lending, whether or not it gets approved, and then they sign on the dotted line. So it is definitely something that has been learned. But there is no real checks and balances for unless you dive into the property and, uh, or to the Muni and ask if there's open permits or not. Any questions by, up by the board? Mr. Quinn. So then you guys are just here out of your own, through the chair, you guys are just here out of your own goodwill trying to close the loop on this before it gets sold. That's true, because we could have sold it. Yeah. We could have. But, like I said, we brought it up to the buyers. We said, hey, we found that these are open. And they said, if you can close them, we'll still buy the property. And now it becomes a disclosure item for Jake. When he goes to sell, we need to check that there are open permits that we've discovered on the property. And nine times out of 10, a buyer is going to look at it and most likely not care and move forward. But it becomes a disclosure issue for him if eventually this comes up again, it could possibly fall back on him. Even though he discloses it, it still opens him up mm -hmm. for liability. Okay. So in summary, it wasn't disclosed to you. You didn't do anything. You're trying to sell it and you're trying to close the loop on this so that it doesn't slip through the cracks. And Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you.
So no other public testimony. And does the staff have any rebuttal? Uh, no, I do not. And does the applicant, is there anything else you want to say? Uh, no, nothing else. Thank you. Okay. Then we'll close the public hearing and the matter rests with the board. May I have a positive motion, please? Mr. Hale. I move in case 2023-0033 to approve a variance from AMC 21.06.020B, table 21.06-1, table of dimensional standards residential districts to allow a triplex to encroach 2.5 feet into the required five foot north side setback subject to the conditions shown on pages four and five of the staff report. And seconded by Mr. Smythe. So Mr. Hale, would you speak to your motion, please? Thank you, through the chair. Uh, so I'll speak about A, B, and C, the rest of the uh, substantially met conditions I agree with. I don't think anyone has any issue with the extraordinary physical circumstance is kind of the key to this thing. And, and I think because of the history of building of this house, the structure itself has become an extraordinary physical feature. You can't just dismantle a portion of it to make it comply. You've got a, it's a homogenous unit at this point and you'd have to destroy the entire thing. So I think it does become a physical feature that, that uh, applies to this, this lot. So I think that with that in mind, that standard is met. It's an extraordinary physical feature. The undue hardship and B, staff says it's partially met. Uh, I think it's completely met because it would be in a, a huge hardship to have to move this structure or to figure out which part of it to chop off. I mean, you're talking a two-story two structure here with a basement, you can't just chop portions of it off to meet the, the standard. So I do think that would be an undue hardship on the owners. And for standard C, uh, being hardship being not self-imposed, it was, it was self-imposed by the, the previous owners, but not by the current owners. They had no idea. And there's only so much due diligence you can do as a private homeowners. They're not professionals, so. You can't expect them to, to do all the research required to dig this stuff up from the beginning. So I, I don't think it's self-imposed, and I think that the standard is met for C as well. That's all I have. Mr. Smythe? Yeah, thank you. Uh, to the chair, I, I agree with everything Dave said on the, on the points. Um, uh, the other component that's important to me is that this had a non-conforming use status. Like, this was... I'm going to chalk it up to sloppy surveying. Nobody puts a house on a lot like this. Uh, and then it w it had a non-conforming use. And then once it was changed, <clears throat> that requires you to go through the rest of the procedures as I understand it. But the, the, uh, the wall of the house, the way the building sits on the lot, none of it was changed. It's the same since 71. It was approved then. Uh, it hasn't had any problem here. I think uh, absolutely ridiculous to imagine this homeowner to tear down this house to meet this requirement. It is obviously... Uh, not economically feasible to make the changes required to shift it to two and a half feet. I support the motion. Is there any further discussion? Mr. Quinn. Through the chair, uh, I agree with everything that was just said. I also think that it's smart and commendable of you and your representative to be here closing the loop on this. Um, you could have passed it on. You didn't. And I think that that I, one, I think it's the right thing to do, and two, I think it's smart just from a pure liability standpoint of your own um, because it could be held against you potentially. Um, that's it. Thanks. Any other discussion? Mr. Romerdahl? Nothing? Uh, yeah, through the chair. I'll just echo the comments made by the other members. I agree. I think it's the right thing to do. I, I do think it, it was not up to the homeowner uh, that put himself in that position, so commend him for trying to do the right thing. I intend to support the motion as well. Thank you. 
Are we ready for the question? The question is on the adoption of the motion to grant a variance to allow a triplex to encroach 2.5 feet into the required five foot north side setback subject to conditions shown on pages four and five of the staff report. A yes vote will grant the variance and a no vote will deny the variance. Please vote. Mr. Romerdahl? Yes. Thank you. There are five votes in the affirmative and no votes in the negative. The variance is granted. Thank you very much. Okay, that's the end of the public hearings. Um, next item on the agenda is reports. I don't have a report. Secretary doesn't have a report. We don't have any committees. Board member comments. Anybody have anything? Nothing? Then I would entertain a positive motion for adjournment. Move to approve or move to adjourn. Right? <laughs> move to approve adjournment. <laughs> Mr. Hale, Mr. Smythe, and Mr. Quinn. So <laughs> we are adjourned. Can I second? Thank you, Andrew. I appreciate Thanks, this. Mom.